Good. My name's Darren. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here. Um, and uh, I'm getting ordained uh, this summer uh, in June. It's going to be a really exciting year for me. Uh, and the excitement has really kicked off already. I've got a bit of a cold today, and I'm dosed up on, on day nurse. At least I hope it was day nurse. I took some tablets from Rod Green. Uh, sort of, <laughs> the sort of thing that they tell you never to do when you're at school. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so that's what I've done. So um, anything could happen in the next half hour. We are <laughs> in our series, Jesus on Every Page, when we've been looking at Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, And Rod has done a fantastic job over the last couple of weeks showing us how Jesus is present at creation. Uh, We've looked last week at how Jesus is the person that all of the covenant promises to Abraham. He's the one that they were all about. And today we're going to be looking at Jesus in Old Testament history. Uh, And Jesus says that the Old Testament history, that in fact all of the Old Testament is all about him. It's all about him. John chapter 5, Jesus says to the Jewish leaders, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you'll find the life of the age to come. In fact, it's those scriptures, it's those scriptures that testify about me. All of the Old Testament is about me. And then Luke 24, uh, Jesus gives this amazing Bible study on the road to Emmaus after the resurrection, the one event in the Bible that I'd love to have been present for, this fantastic Bible study to these two disciples after the resurrection. Uh, And we're told, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So after the resurrection, we see Jesus with his perfect new resurrection body and his perfect new resurrection mind and resurrection perspective on everything, saying that the first five books of the Bible are written by Moses and they're all about him. And today we're looking at one of those books. We're looking at the book of Exodus, the second book written by Moses, and we're going to find Jesus uh, is all over the Exodus. So let me pray for us and then we'll dive in. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to us. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the word of God. And we ask that you would send your spirit today and speak to our hearts, not just to our minds, giving us information about you, but speak to our hearts so we can know you more and love you more. And we ask this for your holy name's sake. Amen. Amen. So Exodus, Jesus taught that the whole of the Old Testament is about him. And throughout his ministry, Jesus especially uses language which is related to the Exodus to describe what he's doing. He especially uses words from Exodus to help his disciples make sense of what he's doing. And we're going to look at some of that as we go through the Exodus story. But all of this really culminates at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Near the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he goes up a mountain and he's transfigured. He's transformed and the glory of the Lord appears on the mountain over Jesus. And and the disciples who are with him are completely freaked out by what's going on. And they don't know what's going on. And we read in Luke that Moses appears and Elijah appears. And they're standing there with him and they're talking with Jesus. And Luke tells us that they spoke about his exodus. They spoke about his exodus which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. So the Exodus story is all about Jesus. The Exodus story is Jesus' Exodus story. The Exodus is completed in Jerusalem. It's completed when Jesus is killed and rises from the dead in Jerusalem. The Exodus is all about Jesus. And we're going to look at a few ways in which Jesus is in the Exodus story. We can't cover all of the ways that he's in the Exodus story, but we're going to look at a few ways that Jesus is in the Exodus story this morning. So let's dive in, because as we start the book of Exodus, we see that Jesus is there right from the beginning. We see that Jesus is the Passover lamb. Jesus is the Passover lamb. So if we just back up from the reading that we heard... God has said that he's going to bless all the nations through Abraham's family and through one offspring in particular. And it doesn't seem like that blessing is going to be very straightforward because here they are and they're in slavery in Egypt. 
They're in slavery in Egypt and Moses is going to Pharaoh with this message from God, Set my, let my people go so they, can, so they can serve me. Let my people go so they can serve me. And Pharaoh says, no way. And God sends a series of plagues showing that the God of Israel is the creator God with power over the whole of creation. God sends plagues to show that he's got power over the water. He sends plagues to show that he's got power over the earth, that he's got power over the harvest to make it happen or not happen. He's got power over the animals. He's got power over the sun in the sky to make it shine or not shine. So God sends all these signs and Pharaoh still says, no way these people aren't going. They're my slaves and they're staying here. And God sends a final plague. And it's a plague of death. And in every Egyptian house, the firstborn son dies. And in every Israelite house, a lamb dies instead. God says to the Israelites, take a male lamb, make sure that it's perfect, make sure there's nothing wrong with it, slaughter it, put the blood of the lamb on your house. And when I see the blood, I won't destroy you when I'm destroying the Egyptians. So God's lamb is killed so that the people of Israel can have life. The lamb of God dies so that God's people aren't punished along with the Egyptians. And 1,400 years later, John the baptizer is standing on the bank of the Jordan and he sees Jesus and he points to him and says, Behold, the lamb of God. Behold, the lamb of God. And he's not saying Jesus looks cute and fluffy in his onesie he's saying that Jesus is gonna die he's saying Jesus is gonna die Jesus is gonna die so that we don't have to that Jesus is gonna be punished as the lamb of God so God's people don't get punished that Jesus is gonna be slaughtered so that instead of death God's people can get freedom Jesus is the lamb of God in exodus Jesus is the Lamb of God in Exodus. John the baptizer says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And 30,000 Israelites walk out of Egypt into freedom. And they come to the Red Sea and at the Red Sea they discover that Jesus is the first fruit of new creation. We're in Exodus 14 now, that reading that we just heard. And the Israelites go through the Red Sea. And God separates the waters from the dry land so that people can go across, so that God's people can go through. The dry earth is separated from the waters. And that should remind us of something. It should remind us of the third day of creation, the day when the earth is separated from the water and dry land appears and life bursts out of the dry earth and the first fruits of life are seen. Uh, And Rod reminded us as well that the third day is the day when Jesus rose from the dead. So here at the Red Sea, Israel, what God's saying with this picture is that Israel are being recreated They're being made new as the people of God, as they walk through on dry land. It's like God's doing creation all over again, starting with Israel. But they're not on their own. They're not on their own. There's someone with them leading the way. There's someone with them keeping the enemy at bay. There's someone with them making it all possible. He's hidden away there in verse 9. The angel of God. The angel of God leading Israel like the captain of an army. At this point in the story, he goes to the rear of the convoy to keep the enemy away. And then he leads them again and he's going to lead them all the way into the promised land. Who is the angel of God? He's also called the angel of the Lord. And he's not just a random angel. In Hebrew, he's the Malak Yahweh or Malak Elohim. And Malak means messenger. You could call him the God messenger or the Yahweh messenger. He appears in human form in the Old Testament and he speaks as if he's God. He speaks as if he's God. So to Moses, out of the burning bush, the angel of the Lord appears and says, I'm the God of your father Abraham. I have seen the affliction of my people. And there's only one person 
in the Bible, in human form, who speaks as if he's God, and that's Jesus. This is Jesus. It's Jesus who goes through the waters on dry land ahead of the Israelites. It's Jesus who's the first fruits of the new creation. It's Jesus who ultimately will lead his people through death safely to the land of promise. Jesus is the first fruits of the perfect earth, the first fruits of the new creation. Most of you will know that uh, later on this year, I'm going to be uh, going up the road to Christchurch up in Spitalfields as a curate, uh, and a friend of mine, Phil Williams, who's over at HTB, is going to be going with me. And over Christmas, we were invited to explore the building of that church uh, up in uh, Spitalfields. So to go up into the roof space and to go up into the tower uh, and to climb over it everywhere into all the nooks and the crannies. Uh, And as we were doing that, we came to this door like halfway up the tower, and it opened out onto the roof. And I could see this roof and then this this kind of drop of 60 meters uh, sort of like down onto a concrete floor and I thought absolutely no way am I getting out on that but Phil who's a lot braver than I am he just ran out ran along the roof and then stood on like a chimney stack at the far end just like with this drop just like right in front of him Uh, and of course you know sort of like he'd led the way so I thought well I just need to get my game face on and get out on the roof which was what I did (laughs) And that's what Jesus has done. He's gone first through the waters of death so we can be confident as we follow him. Paul puts it like this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the Messiah all will be made alive, but in this order, the Messiah going first as the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him will come along after Jesus, Paul says, goes first through the waters of death as the first fruits, then all of us come along behind him. And Jude, Jesus' brother, who has that little letter in the New Testament just before Revelation, says, I want to remind you that Jesus at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. So Jesus is the Lamb of God who rescues his people from slavery. Jesus is the first fruits of the new creation, going through the Red Sea, going through the waters of death to new life. Jesus is the Exodus. Jesus is the Exodus. And as the people of God follow Jesus through the Red Sea, they find themselves in the wilderness. They find themselves in the wilderness and we get to Exodus chapter 16 and we discover that Jesus is bread from heaven. Jesus is bread from heaven. And the people of God there in Exodus chapter 16, they're doing what they do very well. They're moaning. They're moaning, just like church. They're moaning. (laughs) They're moaning because they're hungry. Yeah, just before the 11 a.m. service, I'm always hungry. And there's this amazing miracle that happens that this table at the back just fills up with croissants and pastries, uh, this like miraculous provision. Well, God doesn't give them pastry, he gives them manna. Uh, And it's tasty, and they can grind it up, and they can bake their own pastries with it. And he gives them as much as they need every day. And on the sixth day, he gives them twice as much so they can have a day's rest. And he does this for 40 years. For 40 years, he gives them food from heaven. For 40 years, he gives them food to sustain them. For 40 years, he gives them food to make them strong so they can get to the land of promise. And Jesus, in John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. It's Jesus who's sustaining God's people in the wilderness. If you're hungry this morning, come to Jesus. If you're empty this morning, come to Jesus. If you need strength this morning, come to Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life. And on the cross, his body's broken so that we can share and eat and live. So Jesus is the Lamb of God 
who rescues his people by his blood. He's the first to go through the waters of death to new life. And he's the bread of life, sustaining his people. And then we get to Exodus 17. Exodus 17, we discover that Jesus is water from the rock. In Exodus 17, God's people are doing what they do well. They're moaning. Uh, They're moaning again and they're arguing with their leaders. They're arguing with Moses. Which is amazing, really. So, so you just think about the experiences that they've been through. So that the Lamb of God has just died for them and they've been rescued from Egypt. Jesus has just led them through the Red Sea. They're getting bread from heaven every single day. And they're moaning. They're taking all of those miracles for granted, which is what we do. We take miracles for granted. We forget what God has already done. We forget what he's already shown us. We forget what he's already given. We forget what he's already spoken. And we just keep asking for more. We just keep asking for more. Christmas for you might uh, already be a distant memory. Uh, I can remember one Christmas, it's a little bit embarrassing, when I was maybe 10 or 11. uh, And I just remember, uh, you know, and I think I've I've seen other kids do this as well, so I don't feel so bad about it. I just remember peering over this mountain of gifts on Christmas Day. And I just remember peering over this mountain of gifts and deciding that actually it wasn't enough. And just asking for more, saying, I I haven't got enough. I haven't got enough here. Um, And, you know, my mum was a a single parent. We lived on a council estate. She was claiming benefits. There's quite a lot of sacrifice had gone into all of these gifts. But it's like we're hardwired to be ungrateful. I didn't notice what I had. I just wanted more. And here are the people of God moaning again. They want water, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to want, but they could just ask. You know, they don't need to moan. So Moses is at his wit's end. And he says, what am I to do with these people? They want to kill me. And God answers Moses, Exodus chapter 17, verse 5. He gives, he gives him these really clear directions. He says, go out in front of the people. So stand in front of the whole church. Take with you some of the elders of Israel. Get the leaders up to represent the people. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, with which you struck the Nile in judgment. This is Moses' staff of judgment. And God says, I'll stand before you by the rock at Horeb. So there's this rock, and God's going to stand in front of the rock, and he says to Moses, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses hits the rock. And God is standing in front of the rock, presumably not visibly. If he's standing, we're assuming that he's in human form. Moses hits the rock and he's hitting God. He's hitting God. He's striking God with his staff, with the staff of judgment. And what's going on here is that God is taking the punishment for Israel's moaning. God is taking the punishment for Israel's rebellion and instead of giving them punishment, instead of giving them condemnation, he's giving them the water that they need to stay alive in the desert. And 1,400 years later, Jesus is on the cross and he's pierced with a spear and blood and water comes out. Water comes out of the rock again. And God takes the sins of his people on himself again. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is talking about the Exodus. And he says that the people of Israel drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was the Messiah. That rock was Jesus. Jesus was the rock that was struck in the wilderness so that the people could drink. They drank at Jesus' expense. They were refreshed by water that Jesus had bought for them. Jesus says, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to the life of the age to come. The free gift of the water of life. Jesus gives the water of life and he bought it on the cross. Instead of giving punishment, instead of giving condemnation, the water of life forever. So Jesus is the exodus. Jesus is the whole of the exodus. The Lamb of God dies so that God's people can go free. 
Jesus leads his people through the waters of death, destroying their enemies. Jesus is the bread of life so that they can eat and be strong. Jesus is the water of life so they can live forever instead of being punished. Jesus is everywhere in Exodus. And Exodus is all about God's people being set free. Exodus is all about Jesus and it's all about Jesus' people being set free. Why are they set free? Why are they set free? What are they set free for? Remember God's words to Pharaoh. Let my people go so they can worship me. So they can worship me. And that word in Hebrew is, is, a, is a really interesting word. It's abad. It means work as well. Work and worship. Because in a perfect world, our work is our worship and our worship's our work. Set my, let my people go so they can work for me. So they can worship me. That's what God's saying. And this takes us right back to the garden in Genesis. Adam is put in the garden to work. He's put in the garden to work, but he messes up. He gets thrown out into exile. Israel, Moses asks for Israel that they'll be set free so that they can work. But they mess things up and they get sent into exile. But Jesus obediently does the whole of the work asked of him. His whole life is all about God's work. John chapter 5, Jesus talks about the works the Father has given me to finish, the very works I am doing. And John chapter 17, Jesus prays to the Father and says, I have brought you glory on the earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. On the cross, Jesus' last word is, it is finished. The work is over. The exodus is finished. It's completed. Jesus is the second Adam who does God's work obediently. He's the perfect Israelite who serves God perfectly. He won't get thrown out. He won't get exiled. He'll inherit the whole world. And his exodus work is work done on our behalf. His exodus work sets us free and that's the offer that he wants to make to us this morning do we want to follow him into freedom into worship into life 